Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos from Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington. You'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. And today we have a really great book that I have enjoyed massively. It's called Flavor and Soul, Italian America, and it's African American Edge. And it's written by John Gennari. John, are you there? I'm here, Ken. It's really great to have you. This is a, a very exciting book for me. It's not obvious from my surname, but I'm I'm half Italian, and my family's from the Bronx, so this really resonated with me very strongly. For our listeners, I just want to give them a bit of a background on the book. This comes from Thomas Ferraro. Flavor and soul is so damn good. The reader, whether passingly curious or utterly invested, is going to have a ball and come out wiser, better informed, and more determined to do the right thing. That's that's a review from Thomas Ferraro, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. A, another one from Elizabeth Alexander, the author of The Light of the World. Flavor and Soul is brilliant, encyclopedic scholarship that is also that also accomplishes the rare work of speaking directly to and from the heart. This is a passionate treasure book of scholarship and ultimately a handbook for living a rich, surprising, culturally guided life. And I couldn't agree more. If I were putting this book into academic terms, I'd say it's at least two semesters of material. It's rich, it's deep, and it's dense, but dense in the best sense of the word. In other words, there's a lot of berries on this bush. You could spend a long time with this book and never get to the bottom of it. There's so many interesting things to follow from it. The references to movies, to books, to music, even to food. It just goes on and on. And I think encyclopedic is, is fair. It's also a fun read. And you don't have to necessarily read the whole thing from beginning to end. You can drop in on any section or any chapter and get a lot out of it. John's book covers a lot of interesting topics. Music, of course, food movies, even basketball. I mean, it just, it just goes all over the place. John, what's the central thesis of your book? The central thesis is, th- thanks for having me, Ken, and thanks for those kind words about the, about the book and your experience of reading it. So the central thesis is that Italian Americans and African Americans, I mean, not, not unlike other ethnic groups across the race line, have had a complicated and fascinating relationship that more complicated and fascinating than most kind of mass media stereotyping of the relationship presents. There's a, there's a bigger story, and I think a more important story, about a kind of shared culture and a kind of cultural intersection between these groups in the cultural forms that you, that you enumerated, music, food, sport, entertainment more generally, movies, television, etc. And I think it goes back to shared, what I like to call expressive style, an emphasis on self-dramatization in the, both the best and worst sense of that, of, that, of that phrase. The willingness to express emotion. I mean, I'm, I'm what I'm listing here are oftentimes stereotypes used against these people. They're too emotive, they're too loud, et cetera. But I think there's always a little bit of truth in stereotypes, and the truth here has to do with the way that these people coming from these two cultural experiences, they, they think of everyday life as a kind of evolving artwork, and their, their approach to everyday speech, everyday talk, 
their approach to the to the table, their approach to interpersonal relations, their their ways of their ways of dramatizing, sometimes over dramatizing the way that they're feeling. Most importantly, their recognition of feeling and feeling itself as an important the most important part of of identity. And I'm not saying that these are the only two groups that exhibit these kinds of traits, but but these two groups do, and in their relations with each other, they do it in a way that oftentimes leads to really, to me, very, very interesting results. The cover of the book is Frank Sinatra with Count Basie, great records that they that these two great figures made in the mid-1960s. We could say the same about the relationship between Louis Prima and Louis Armstrong and other musicians in, in Italian and black musicians in, in New Orleans. We could say the same about, as I get into it in the book, the relations that are relationships that are developed between Italian-American basketball coaches, but I focus in that chapter mostly on the college game. And, I mean, it just struck me one day, why, I mean, Nobody could name a great Italian-American college basketball player, but if we stop and think about it, there are all kinds of great Italian-American basketball coaches. Patino, Calipari, going back to the 80s and 90s, Massimino, Carlissimo, etc. Dick Vitale, a coach who becomes a broadcaster whose uh, sound, for better or worse, has been at the center of college basketball for 30, 30 years now. And so... I'm, I'm interested, in, in other words, in a, a broader-minded, comp, more complex reckoning with this relationship. There's been collision. There's also been collusion. There's been amity. There's also been enmity. And I think there's, at the heart of this, a, a kind of blues sensibility, a, a willingness to confront the hard things about life, give expression to them, give frank and honest expression to them, and, and to make to make song out of it, not just song in the formal sense, but the what the great poet William Carlos Williams called in his poem, The Desert Music, he called it the music of survival. Music per se, but, you know, the everyday, just getting on, getting on with things and, and, and dealing with the pragmatics of life in a forthright way. And, and I think that kind of reckoning with pain and suffering and all that, you know, all that, that ails us leads paradoxically to a greater, you know, kind of joy and celebration of life. And that kind of deep vividness of personal experience, I think, comes through in the intersections of these two populations. You mentioned in the book that cities like Naples and Palermo were cultural crossroads. They weren't just European. They also had influences from Africa because they're actually fairly close to Africa and from the Arab world. So southern Italy in particular, and Italy is, a, as people that people who know Italy know, Italy is really not one place. It's, o- it's only been one place in the last, I don't know, maybe 100 years. But before that, it it's, was very distinct, culturally distinct places, still, still are culturally distinct. So southern Italy and Sicily, very different from the Milan area and, and, and northern Italy. So there was, a, there was actually a, a literal African influence flowing through southern Italy and Sicily. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I think that jazz scholars need, need to reckon with this more, more, more fully. It's happening in some of the scholarship coming out of Italy now. And it needs to do so in the U.S. As, as well. I mean, we tell the story of New Orleans properly so as a as a crossroads of culture, coming together of you know blues and European various European musics that you know that become part of the soundscape of of New Orleans French opera, Italian opera for that matter, but also the the influence of the of the Caribbean military march music, et cetera, and all of that works its way into early jazz. Well, Naples and Palermo are similar crossroads a little bit earlier than than New Orleans, and it's not a coincidence that it's Sicilians mostly that end up in New Orleans of the Italians who who migrate to the to the New World. It's Sicilians that replace black workers on on the plantations after reconstruction. Some of them find their way into New Orleans, into 
fruit and vegetable trade, you know, kind of trades and food marketing and such. And, and, and we know the stories about Louis Armstrong working for the Matranga family, working for Italian and Jewish families and, you know, kind of absorbing the music and culture of those, of those groups. But that's generally as far as we go with, you know, kind of investigating that, you know, that particular, you know, kind of contact, cultural contact zone. It'd be worthwhile to really think about how the, you know, Sicilian brass bands, for instance, that are part of, again, a really important part of the soundscape in New Orleans, St. Joseph's Day celebrations, other Saints' Day celebrations in New Orleans, and how they how they interact with second line parading in the African American community during that time, and just how you know musicians they pick up the sounds that are part of their their world, and their world is not just the music that gets passed down to them from you know from their own families. Before we went on, you were telling me a story that you heard about Robert Johnson coming to Newark at, at one point, Newark, New Jersey, and playing Italian wedding music. Well, you know, musicians of that era, they had to learn all kinds of music. They had to learn everybody's music because they were social musicians. I mean, they had to play all kinds of different events, and and, and they became they became conversant. You, you mentioned something. And, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, you know, and I, th- I think this had a... I think there's a deeper and richer story to be told about Sicilian and other Southern Italian music in New Orleans because that music itself, as you, as your, the way you framed your question, put you know, put it well. There's already a kind of African influence in in those Southern Italian urban spaces, and then you know to think of a kind of Black Mediterranean, Black Atlantic synthesis in which. You know, people are moving, human migrations to the U.S., to Argentina. This, this is also the time when the tango is invented, again, in a kind of confluence of African, Italian, Latin American, you know, kind of sounds and, and cultural, you know, kind of cultural ex- expressivity. And, and these things very quickly become canonized and commodified, and records are circulating you know, across the Atlantic, across the Mediterranean, and, and making, you know, these soundscapes available to, to, these, to these groups. And so there's a kind of mutual set of developments that are happening on the ground, but also happening because culture has been commodified during this period, and people are able to listen, you know, to Neapolitan music, for instance, which is so central to the development of American popular song. So there's a lot going on, and a lot more to be written, I, th- I think, about the way that jazz and other American musics develop out of this out of this multi-layered, you know, kind of kind of cultural stylistic swirl. About you mentioned tango. Some people might not be aware that even though Argentina is a Spanish-speaking place, it is a heavily Italian place. Absolutely. Uh, I, th- I think I, I can't remember the percentage, but I think one quarter at least of the European, well, it's largely a European country at this point, but a huge percentage of, of Argentinians have Italian surnames. But that's true also of Brazil. And taking this back to New Orleans, the age before the jazz age of the 20s, we forget, was actually called the tango age. And there was right. a whole tango, I forget what they called it, but there was like a tango set, a block or a tango district in New Orleans. And that was that music called tango and it may not be the kind of thing we associate perfectly with tango today but music called tango was the popular music in new orleans previous to let's say 1920s and the, and the jazz age you know it's interesting about the the italian influence and the italian collaborations in cuba it's pretty well accepted that cuban music is a fusion of spanish music especially from andalusia and African music. Of course, Andalusia, great African influence. And that's, that's just grasped and understood and, and not mysterious to anybody. But I think these, these Italian connections are, are not anywhere near as well appreciated. One thing, and I, I don't remember if I saw this in your book. I might have passed it over if it is in there. So correct me if I'm wrong. But one of the, the big mysteries to me in New Orleans 
is you have the Mardi Gras Indians, which in some way are the most authentic, central, deep-rooted musical tradition in all of New Orleans. It, it may go back all the way to Congo Square. And they come out on Mardi Gras morning, of course. But their other day that they come out, that they make a huge deal about, is St. Joseph's Day. St. Joseph's Day, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any background on why that is? Why they should be honoring a Italian Sicilian saint? <laughs> well, again, I think I think it just speaks to the to the intimacy of these of these two groups, and they were living cheek by jowl, and you know they're looking you know for any excuse to party essentially to to make music to to take to the streets to create culture to create connection. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that there's a there's a more thorough story to be told, you know, partly probably having to do with shared religious a synthesis of, of, of religious belief systems and the shared iconography of, you know, saints. And I mean, the story is told in Haiti and in Haitian Voudon about the, you know, kind of absorption of, of Catholic saints and Catholic icon into the vernacular tradition, and I think there's probably something very similar going on in New Orleans during that time. And you know, I think it's some, something that religious studies scholars have probably already gotten pretty deeply into, and I just haven't fully apprised myself of it. Well, I'm I'm pretty well read in that area, and. and spent a lot of time in New Orleans and nobody's been able <laughs> to tell me yeah. wh when that exactly happened. And, and, and going back to Cuba again, that's another area where Catholic saints readily absorbed, readily appreciated by the, the Afro culture right. there. Well, we've, we've, then we've outlined a, a research project for not just one person, probably a whole school of people. Yeah, it's one of, the, it's one of those things that's hidden in plain sight. I mean, there, there's nothing more New Orleans than Mardi Gras Indians, and that they have chosen St. Joseph's Day as the second big day, only second only to Mardi Gras, I think is, is really significant. There's another, you were talking about characteristics of Afro culture and it, it, Italian culture, but one of the characteristics that you also mentioned in the book, and you make a really interesting point about, is this appreciation of cool. Yeah. Uh, so so there, is a, there is a lot of emotion, there's a lot of sensuality, there's a lot of, you know, you know, pre, you know, just living life large. That's an Italian trait, that's an African trait. And we're contrasting these with the dominant, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture, which is a little more subdued and a little more buttoned up. But there's this other trait that, that comes both from African culture and Italian culture. And, and you even quote a great Italian word. I, it begins with S-P-E. Spezzatura. Spezzatura. Yeah. Uh, tell us what spezzatura means and, and how that, I think people will recognize this, this attitude also in, in Afro-American culture too. Yeah, so spe spezzatura is, uh, I mean, to, to put it most understandably, it means making hard work look easy. <laughs> Having a kind of cool, relaxed kind of approach to, to something that actually is not easy to do, and it, it, it comes from Baldassare Castiglione, classic handbook of, matter, of manners, Il Coto Giano, and it was about how princes, this is going back to the kind of, you know, kind of pre-Italian unification, you know, period, how, how, should, how should the gentlemen princes running the nation states act? Well, they should, you know, they, they should show a kind of avoidance of affectation and a kind of Italian, contemporary Italian cultural theorist, Pellegrino de Cerno calls it, a studied carelessness, creating excitement without getting excited oneself. And this was a kind of definition of what art should be as well, not affected. It should just be what it is. And so this becomes a kind of, this becomes a kind of cultural style. I mean, in Afro... African culture and an African American culture. My friend and colleague Joel Dinnerstein has become really the great connoisseur of cool and historian of cool. And he makes a an interesting argument about the distinction between West African cool. It's not just African descended peoples that have traditions of cool. He makes 
an interesting kind of comparison between West African cool and British or English cool. In the British or English case, and you think of James Bond, maybe, you know, foremost, and then in the American context, the extension of, of that being John Wayne or Clint Eastwood, characters who are very prepossessing, masculine characters, you know, cool in their ability to contain emotion, but they're, they're also dispensers of violence in some way in defense of the community, in defense of, you know, of, of the society. But they're but the key thing is that they are individual heroes. And Dinnerstein's sense of things is that in the West African context, and he says one, one place to, to look at this is just in West African music and dance, the drum circle. It's, it's more about community than individual, you know, kind of putting an individual signature on it. And the way that one's rhythms, the way that one's, the way that one's body postures and cadences have to contribute to a kind of community flow. Flow is, is really groove, and flow are the important things here. And in the case of jazz, you can see a kind of combination of West African and European coming together in a figure like, like Miles Davis, who is very enchanted with a James Bond you know, kind of cool or a Frank Sinatra cool or a Marlon Brando cool, but maybe he's also distilling that West African sense of, you know, kind of community groove or flow. And we see this in, we see this in Italian culture with maybe the, the paragon is not Sinatra, but Dean Martin, maybe the coolest cat of all in certainly in the Italian American, you know, kind of singer canon. But in mid 20th century America, I mean, who, who gave off that sense of nonchalance and, you know, almost a kind of disdain or indifference as a stylistic kind of as a stylistic kind of kind of signature at the same time that you you understood that this is a person who had to work really hard to get to the point where they could they could feign indifference if you will mm -hmm. um, and the and the and the rap pack becomes this you know these these are immigrants or they're you know they're gr people who grow up in ethnic immigrant families and traditionally the the formula for immigrant assimilation is hard work hard work and, you know, a kind of subordinate posture toward the dominant, you know, toward the dominant class. And here are Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr. and the others. They're going on stage and these 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 entertainers who've, you know, worked extremely hard through the years to perfect their craft. They're making believe that they're drunk. They're making believe that they can't hold a tune. They're trying to, they're, you know, the jokes flop. I mean, everything kind of falls apart. So there's this, you know, this sense of a kind of ethnic immigrant arrival that has less to do with, you know, duty and obeisance and, you know, in serving a master than you can be who you are and who you are and, you know, a kind of sense of presence and a poised sense of self you know, kind of kind of works its way into these performance modes. And so, I mean, it's not, therefore, coincidental that Miles Davis and Frank Sinatra have, even though they never connected personally or, you know, knew each other in any, in any substantive way, but they were great admirers of each other because I think they both possess that kind of sense of self. Yeah, and even, even down to the detail of, an appreciation of fine clothes. La bella you know. figura, right? You always, bella figura, uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you have a you have a responsibility in your you know public presentation of self to you know to appear dignified, to appear you know in such a way that you're going to lend dignity and seriousness and style to the occasion. And then on the other hand, there's that entertainment angle like embodied in Dean Martin or in a piano player let's say like Fats Waller who was a you know spectacularly accomplished musician but he always made the playing seem like sec a second thought and he was always goofing around and and being very down to earth about what he was doing making a very difficult thing seem seem easy and social at the same time 
not a lone artist sitting up there on the stage with everybody having to, you know, sit silently watching him, but basically running a party from, from the piano. Joel Dinistry has this great phrase, relaxed intensity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that kind of, it's, you know, kind of oxymoron. And it's, I think, perfect in the way that it ca- captures. I mean, there's, there's intensity in the, in, in the music, in the precision of the music, in the, you know, the, 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 the demand that the music makes on its player. And that's a given. But, you know, it's not going to come off correctly if you're showing that intensity, right? If you're spreading right. the details, if you're if you're pushing it rhythmically, I mean, almost you know, swing itself. I mean, swing itself is cool, right? That that mm-hmm. you know that that relaxed intensity swing. You know, if you think of it that way, it's like you're there's a flow, there's a groove that's moving, but if you push it too hard, it doesn't swing, right? It doesn't have that yep. lilt. It doesn't have that that syncopation. It doesn't hold. It needs to hold back even as it's moving forward. Yep, yep. Hey, let, let's look a little bit under the hood of, of the en- at the engine of, of jazz in terms of in- Italian influences. You mentioned in the book, and this is something that I was not aware of, I don't know how I missed this, but that Louis Armstrong was a huge fan of opera. Can you talk a little bit about that as a young, as a young man in New Orleans? That's right. So this came about, again, because of the fact that Armstrong worked for Henry Matranga, who had a honky-tonk, you know, a place where music was being played. The Matranga family essentially controlled the fruit import business in, in New Orleans at, at the time. And he heard, he, he heard Caruso on record at the Matranga honky-tonk and in their, you know, as a guest in their, in their house. And he was so taken by, you know, the kind of bravura, the kind of, you know, kind of emotion, you know, kind of not undisciplined emotion, but the, but the disciplined emotionality of, of the sound, the control of the sound, but the way that the sound really expressed deep, deep, deep feeling. And he became really interested in this, in this music and studied it pretty closely. I, you know, studied it not in conservatory sense of things, but he had the records and he listened to the records so much that he was able to, to work kind of opera sound bites into his solo, the so-called Rigoletto break in New Orleans Stomp. He quotes Vesti La Juba in at least two recordings of Tiger Rag. Endless, you know, kind of live performances, some of which, you know, are, you know, captured for us. And we can chase down on YouTube some that are probably lost to history. But people talk about Louis Armstrong just, you know, in the middle of a solo, all of a sudden you're, you're, you know that you've heard this before. What is it? Well, it turns out that he's quoting from some, not just Caruso, but generally from Italian opera. He would have, he would have known French opera as well. Sidney Bechet was probably more deeply into French opera than Italian opera, but he was also a great admirer of, of Caruso as well. And I make the case early in the book that Caruso, not just Caruso, but the Neapolitan tradition, Neapolitan, Tana Canzone, Neapolitan song tradition, is in a way a kind of distillation of, of both blues and soul, what we later come to call soul music, in that it's, it's, express, it's, it's expressing melancholy, right? It's expe- the, the, the Italian word for it is passione, passion, passion not just in you know, deep feeling for someone or something, but the kind of you know, kind of depth of feeling that comes from experience, maybe particularly romantic experience, but it's also the reality of poverty and and injustice and love and love lost and you know the fleshly pleasures of of these of these communities that were always again you know no matter how hard the work, no matter how difficult the you know the work arrangement, there was always an effort to get back to the to the table, to get back to the, you know, to the place of revelry and, you know, to, to celebrate life itself and, and, and to do so with, you know, kind of honesty, you know, to confront pain, to, to name the suffering and to overcome it there, thereby. I mean, if you, you think of American popular song from the 20s down to the 50s. I mean, it's essentially looking at life through rose-colored glasses, right? 
beautiful songs. I mean, we, we love these songs. We And Sinatra and others, you know, do wonderful things with these songs. But they're, they're sort of the opposite of, of blues. I mean, literally, looking at the world through rose-colored glasses, that's the opposite of what the blues says you should do, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. You, shouldn't, mm-hmm. you shouldn't try to kind of conceal or paper over what you're actually feeling. And so there's, there's something, I think, that, that African-American musicians coming out of their traditions of spirituals and work songs, that they, they hear in this music that sounds familiar. And they didn't know the language. They didn't know the Italian that it was, you know, kind of sung in. It was sung in in Italian. So they didn't necessarily know the stories that were being told. But you didn't need to know (laughs) the words to to know that there was feeling being expressed deeply and forthrightly. And in the time that Louis Armstrong was growing up and, and a lot of the formative foundational jazz musicians were growing up, opera was a big deal. You know, this, we have to kind of transport ourselves back into time. There was no jazz. There was no rock and roll. There was no yep. TV. There was no radio. Music choices were pretty limited. And the first hits, some, I, think, I think Caruso might have been the first guy to have a recorded hit ever. So opera well, would have been in the... Yeah. Yep. No, exactly right. That's Dila Juba, which he recorded in 1904, was the first... He did the tenor, it was the tenor aria from Leon Cavallo's Pagliacci. That's the first million-selling record in history. Okay, there, there you go. There yeah. you go. And for people that don't, maybe not, don't know the history, there, there definitely have, there were a lot of blues. <laughs> I don't mean blues music, but reasons for the blues in Sicily and in southern Italy. And I wish I, I'm drawing a blank on the, the man's name, but he's a famous Afro-American from the 19th century, and he went to visit Sicily, and he came back with a statement that nobody is suffering worse than the rural people of Sicily right now. Well, Booker T. Washington. There you go. Booker, yeah. Yeah. Booker T. went, to, went to, the, to the Italian South and, and, and made such a statement. Frederick Douglass didn't go to Italy, but based on what he was hearing you know, in the documentary evidence, he said, he said the same thing. I mean, they weren't there was no effort to minimize the suffering of African slaves in, in, in America, but there was a similar kind of brutalism that was going on in those latifundia, those large plantations in the Italian South where, you know, this is agricultural work, but the workers are not able to, to even eat the food that they're growing. I mean, the, the level of not even poverty. I mean, it's below poverty. It's like a subsistence level survivalist kind of situation that some of these, many of these folks are in. And these statements, by the way, were, were, were made post-slavery, so that no one was, yeah. com- they were, no one was comparing slavery to, to that. But in in the post-slavery era, and to, I mean, just so to give people an idea, things were so bad in Sicily that it was not uncommon for families to pawn their children to sulfur mine operators. Uh, with the hope that eventually they'd get their children back. That's right. And some, that's right. sometimes those children didn't come back. That's, that's how poor and desperate conditions were in Sicily. So there's, you know, in terms of suffering, there, there was a commonality there as well. And I think also this is, again, something people of the current era cannot imagine, but Italian, Italian immigrants were not particularly welcome in the 19th and early 20th centuries in the United States. And in fact, the biggest lynching in human hi- in American history was of Italian immigrants, right? As you know, as you mentioned in the book, yep. right in downtown New Orleans. I mean, they hung these guys from the st- the lamp poles on Canal Street, which is the equivalent of Broadway or Market Street in San Francisco. So there's definitely a lot of shared experience. And one thing that I had read somewhere too is that the Sicilians in in New Orleans, of course, you know, they came over, my understanding is largely because of the uh, orange and citrus fruit trade. There was a lot before Florida and before California, Sicily was the the mother load of all citrus fruit, you know, and there were regular boats coming to New Orleans. And so there was always room for passengers. And that's how a lot of Sicilians got there. And as many immigrants do, they set up shops. And one of the things that made Sicilians unique is they served black customers. Right. And that made them very different. So, so a lot of 
lot of on the ground connections between Afro Americans and, and Sicilians and Southern Italians. Somebody, you, you quote an article. The article title is so interesting. It, it's called Bel Canto Meets Funk. Right. Could you it, it elaborate on that a little bit? That that idea, which I think is is a brilliant thought. Well, the the title comes from Bruce Boyd Bruce Boyd Rayburn, who is a great jazz historian, archivist, recently retired from running the Jazz Archive at Tulane University, and it originated, interestingly, actually, it was a keynote speech that he gave at the Italian American Studies Association meeting one year in either New Orleans or Baton Rouge. No, it must have been New Orleans, because I wasn't able to make it that year. I did go to Baton Rouge a couple of years before that. And, and the idea is a combination of the high and the low, if you will. I mean, and, and there's a phrase in Italian culture itself called alto basso, the high and the low, you know, sort of joined together. And that's, you know, what makes great, great art, that's particularly in music, that, you know, kind of combination. And the frisson between those two things is what, you know, re- really makes for a kind of compelling, you know, kind of sonic dynamic. And so for Rayburn, it's the synthesis of a kind of Italian vocal aesthetic of melodic beauty with black vernacular emphasis on, you know, kind of earthy, sensual vitality, a joining of lyricism and and rhythmic groove. And if you think about it, that's what early jazz, rhythm and blues, particularly doo-wop, I mean, doo-wop gets sort of lost in the in the discussion of, you know, kind of the history of American popular music. But doo-wop, you know, dominated by black and Italian groups in the late late 50s. And what is it? It's, it's, it's you know, vocal lyricism, melodic beauty, romantic, you know, kind of lyric content with, you know, with a kind of vital rhythmic bass to it in the music. And... I'd say the same thing about soul music. And so I think that phrase, Bel Canto meets the funk, serves as really terrific, you know, kind of capsule, soundbite-ish kind of, kind of summary statement about this intersection of Italian and black in American popular music. Well, New Orleans is often called, I don't know if it's, these words aren't specifically used, but the roots of jazz are often thought to be a fusion of the Creole tradition, where you had very well-educated musicians, they, they had conservatory-level education, with musicians who's, who were either personally cane cutters or the, the, the sons and daughters of cane cutters who had no education, no formal education to speak of, certainly no conservatory education. And when these two groups of musicians met in New Orleans, they combined the dynamism of, of, the, of the cane cutters with the sophistication of the Creole musicians. But I think there's room in this I hate to use this gumbo analogy because it's so yeah. overused, but I think there's room in this gumbo for the bel canto Italian influence. And, and you pointed out earlier, and you point out in the book, that Italians had brass bands, Italians had street parades, Italians had processions. So right. the, the, the things that we associate with New Orleans are, are also can easily be associated with southern Italy and Sicily. That's right. And, you know, the other, the other thing I point to in the book the tradition in a chapter of the book called Everybody Eats, and it's about sort of the intersection of food and music in these two cultures. And, you know, one of the key generative spaces of jazz are the streets themselves of New Orleans, Charleston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Newark, you know, places with large populations of blacks, Italians, Jews, other ethnics. And there's a kind of polyphony of food purveyance that serves as a kind of sonic template for the music. And I talk about, you know, Miles Davis's version of Fisherman, Strawberry, and Devil, and Here Comes the Honey Man on his Porgy and Bess 1958 LP. I talk about Herbie Hancock's Watermelon Man, that great tune from the early 60s, that he writes thinking about the men who hawk fruit on the Chicago streets of his youth and the way that the tune's groove mimics the rhythm of the vendor's movement through the streets and the and the melody, the riff melody, water, melon, man, five syllable phrase, was literally the phrase that neighborhood folks were calling out 
you know, for the watermelon man to come by and, and, and sell sell his watermelon. I mean, it's no coincidence then that so many jazz and early blues tunes have, you know, food titles. And I give a, a kind of breakdown of them in the book or that, you know, jazz continues to be associated with, you know, jazz supper clubs in contemporary New York or, you know, Charlie Parker jamming in the in the kitchen of clubs in Harlem. I mean, that's the space in which the gr- the real breakthroughs in you know kind of the the bebop style come about. And so that there's you know there's just so much um, crossover between food and, and 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 music. And then if you think about it, these are these are the two things that you know that enter the body, <laughs> if you will, uh-huh. and. And, and, and thereby, you know, become, I think, for these two groups, the, you know, sort of the formula for becoming not so much assimilating into American culture because it's, they're, they're introducing new cultures into the American equation because that, that kind of Anglo-Puritan ideal is suspicious of food and music and appetite and, and the body itself. But the, these two groups and others, Jews as well, Latinos, obviously, Asians, and we see this redoubling with, you know, kind of recent immigrant patterns. You know, this becomes the way in which different ethnic groups can can relate to each other. You know, these consumer cultures of food, food and music. And and and, and so I'm making an effort in in that chapter to sort of connect early jazz and blues history with this larger history of immigration and formation of ethnic communities in urban America. Well, speaking of food, one of the great record producers of all time and, and one of the godfathers of rock and roll, as we know it, member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Cosimo Matassa, started out from a grocer. His family were grocers, and he ended up being the guy who invited people like Fats Domino into a recording studio, which was a very unlikely thing to happen in New Orleans, segregated right. as it was. And the people don't know that story. They should. They should definitely be familiar with it. That oh, there was a Sicilian. Is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a huge, huge. I mean, he's you know the record producer who essentially authors the the New Orleans sound of rhythm and blues and, and early rock and roll. Domino, the those early Aaron Neville records. I mean, so, so many of the great. Records from the late late fifties, early sixties, sixties come out of J and M studios in in New Orleans. And you're quite right. I mean, his family background is in is in food, grocery. They also, you know, had had a bar with a jukebox, and that's what gets him interested in in music. And he's just he's gotten more attention since he since he passed a few years ago. And the obituaries caught people's attention, and you know. Good biographies of people like Fats Domino have, you know, put him, g- given him a little bit more bandwidth. But somebody actually should write a biography of of Cosmo Matassa, just a very, very important, not household name kind of figure. And he kind of embodies what we're talking about. I've, I did have a chance to to hear him speak several times, and very down to earth, very earthy. Very open-minded, obviously, very sociable, very workmanlike. You know, all these virtues that Italian-American culture really values. A man's man, you know. Hey, speaking of that, maybe as a way to to bring this to a close, I can't believe we're already into an hour here. (laughs) Speaking of a man's man, one of the things that really caught my eye, and something that I hadn't been aware of and really speaks volumes, is how revered Frank Sinatra was by was and is by contemporary afro-american uh popular musical artists can you talk a little bit about that i mean they really really looked up to him well that that's the thing that actually got me started on this project many many years ago it originated in the mid-1990s when i did a conference paper that became a very short punchy kind of essay called Passing for Italian, Crooners and Gangsters in Crossover Culture. And it started with my noticing in Vibe magazine, the kind of slick hip-hop music, fashion, politics magazine of the, of the period. And it was a piece by a writer named Bones Malone, who I had been reading in Vibe and 
the source and, and elsewhere during during that period about rap music and you know kind of black urban culture and style and he had this this really interesting kind of Brooklyn vernacular black vernacular kind of voice in in his writing it just blew my mind that I opened up vibe one one month and he's he's doing a feature piece on Frank Sinatra calling him the the OG the original gangsta and, and singing the praises of, of Sinatra as a singer, but also as a kind of model of a kind of ethnic outsider who becomes the ultimate insider, right? And that kind of is the formula for the hip-hop performers who become tycoons, you know, like Puff Daddy and, and Jay-Z. You know, they go from cutting records to owning companies and patching fashion lines and you know, just becoming celebrity figures, and they explicitly liken themselves to, to Sinatra. It was either Puff Daddy or, or Jay-Z calling, calling himself the Black Sinatra. And so that image of Sinatra as the, the chairman of the board, who's got all this, this power, he's got a way with women, etc., but he also never loses a connection to his community of origin. And I think this is romanticized to a degree because Sinatra did lose connection with Hoboken <laughs> and sure. never really wanted to go back to Hoboken. But he didn't lose connection with, with his friends, his Italian friends, and the you know, kind of saloon culture and the, you know, the way he sounded on stage with that you know, really kind of beautifully, the, not just the bel canto you know, kind of melodic, lyricism, but the studied, you know, kind of effort to, you know, to speak perfectly eloquent English. I mean, he worked very hard at that in a way that Dean Martin didn't, for instance. And you, and you listen to Dean Martin, and he does sound like somebody for whom English was his second language. And he doesn't try to hide that. Sinatra does hide that in the music. He doesn't hide that in his personal life. And he remains, you know, close to Jilly Rizzo's and, you know, the Patsy's restaurant and, and all of that, and a little too close to figures of the underworld for some people's comfort. But that was, you know, generally true of entertainment figures in that, in that period. I mean, the fact that Sinatra doesn't change his name. You know, management wanted to change his, his name to Frankie Satin. And Frankie, says, Satin. <laughs> Frankie Satin. Frankie <laughs> Satin. He says, no, the name is Frank fucking Sinatra. <laughs> and it was that kind of that that kind of gesture that that endeared you know Sinatra to the not just to the wise guys but to the corner boys as another a scholar of Italian America Tom Ferraro talks about Sinatra that he he left Hoboken but he didn't leave behind the ethos of the corner boys and I think that's what what the black hip hop entrepreneurs are going for right they want the celebrity they want the grandiosity, the grandiose selfhood, but they they want to be seen as still connected to their community of origin. There's a quote about Sinatra. He didn't take orders. He took charge. And this is the great challenge of immigrants or or peoples who are not c considered part of the uh, establishment you know you know what do you do you find yourself in a country where you're maybe not welcome where you're maybe not respected how do you work your way out of that and it was a common problem that both Italians Americans and Afro Americans have faced and face and they work their way out through diligence and creativity and, and grit uh, using various means music which is a it's shared by African Americans and Italian Americans, food, which goes without saying, shared. And then you have a whole chapter on basketball, which is a whole other thing. So I want to say to anybody who's interested in this topic, and we, we didn't even scratch the surface of this book. I mean, it's so deep, and there's so much in it. If you're interested in music, you're going to have revelation almost on every page. If you're interested in food, you're going to love reading this. You, you make reference to a lot of great books that I had to just order from the library. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm going to have to read. And then if you're interested in sports, it's an angle on sports. And I even knew the Carlissimos. I grew up in partially in Montclair, New Jersey, so I, I knew the Carlissimo family. And it never occurred to me how many top flight basketball coaches were Italian Americans. And, you know, the, you know, the thing is, if you're not part of the dominant group, you know, you're not going to be invited to go to law school or medical school or 
be a C-level executive. So what do you do? Well, you take you take the things that you can take. And for Italian Americans and for Afro Americans, that's music, sports, food, entertainment, and we have a lot of, of things in common. And the, yeah. again, taking taking people back to the cover, the photograph of just this is one of the most beautiful book covers I've ever seen. Honest, honestly, who I don't know who designed it, but. They just hit it perfectly. And this photograph that was selected with, with Frank Sinatra and Count Basie in the recording studio together is just, it's almost worth the price of the book alone. But if you're looking for something to really sink your teeth into that will feed you for a long, long time, this and you find this topic interesting, I, I cannot recommend Flavor and Soul by John Gennari too highly. It is just a fantastic book. John, thanks for the time today. Thanks for writing this book. It, it's already the, one of the highlights of my summer, and the summer hasn't even started. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken. It's been really a wonderful interview and your insight into, into the book and you know what's between the lines of the book is really something. So I've really enjoyed this. Well, I, th- I thank my Italian ancestors for any, <laughs> any subtlety and skills I have. <laughs> There you go. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos. (laughs) 